Thank you and welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for the 2022 uh, post-election impact webinar on the arts. Um, this is a program that we've been doing every two years for probably two decades. Um, my name is Nina Oslo Tunjli. I wear two hats here um, with Americans for the Arts. I'm the Chief Counsel of Government and Public Affairs, and I'm the Executive Director of the Americans for the Arts Action Fund. Um, today, I'd like to um, go over what today's agenda is going to look like, the order of our speakers, and the time that we'll have for Q&A. Um, so, um, we will start with um, uh, an overview that um, Nolan Bivens, Americans for the Arts President and CEO, and I will share on overview of the election impact and him specifically on advocacy opportunities during a climate of change. Um, that will be followed by a panel of con Congressional Federal Affairs staff, Tushar Swain and Tara Proby, along with guest speaker Jeremy Johnson, who's the president and CEO of Assembly for the Arts in Cleveland, Ohio. After they each provide their remarks, I'll begin to pose some of the questions that get posted in the Q&A section. And remember, those that get upvoted will have the highest chance that I'll be able to pose those questions to the panelists for this group. Um, after that um, team of panelists concludes, we'll move on to state and local changes and grassroots impact um, on the arts. And hopefully we'll be able to have enough time for a Q&A section after that as well. These speakers will feature from Americans for the Arts team, Jay Dick, Senior Director of State and Local Government Affairs, and Josh Reynolds, our Government Affairs Coordinator. But we also have two great guest speakers with us and members, Tom DeCaney, Executive Director of Create California, and Patrick McWhorter, who's the CEO of Arizona Citizens for the Arts. Um, and as I mentioned, that will be followed with a Q&A. And then we will conclude our webinar with remarks by the amazing Congresswoman Suzanne Bonamici of Oregon, representing the Portland, Air, Oregon area. And um, she is not only the chair of the Congressional STEAM Caucus, but probably one of the best arts champions on Capitol Hill for us. So with that as the overview, I'd like to just kick off some top line um, takeaways that I have from the federal election. Um, so in terms of party control, we've already seen from the headlines <clears throat> that the red wave didn't materialize, but it did materialize enough to flip control of the U.S. House of Representatives. Um, the Senate will remain in control. Um, the Democrats will remain in control of the Senate at the moment. At minimally, it would be a 50-50 split, which is what they've been doing for the last two years anyways. Um, of course, what that means is Vice President Kamala Harris would be the tiebreaker, and that's why it's noted that it's primarily a democratically controlled, ultimately, um, Senate. However, there's a big Georgia runoff happening with uh, incumbent Senator uh, Raphael Warnock, who... Um, certainly led in the general election with votes, but because he didn't reach the 50% point in Georgia, that um, triggers an automatic runoff, which will happen on December 6th. If he wins, um, what that means is the Senates will have actual operating control of the Senate. And um, that means instead of sharing co-chairmanships, Republicans and Democrats of various committees, that means Democrats will have full control of the chairmanships, and then it will go to a ranking um, minority for those in Republicans. But it's still a very close margin. In some ways, control of either the House and Senate is nominal because it's going to require an enormous amount of negotiations, horse trading to get anything done. Um, now, the fact that the Senate did remain control um, of the Senate it does make things a little bit easier for the White House to get um, judge appointments through all of the political appointments for the federal agencies throughout, including the National Endowment for the Arts, National Council on the Arts members, National Council on Humanities members. All of those are 
um, political appointments that have to be confirmed by the Senate only, not the House. So a lot of those will be able to still move relatively smoothly um, between the White House and the Senate. Um, and there are quite a few vacancies that still have to be filled in many of the cultural agencies, museums, and things like that. Um, in terms of um, our, uh, on the House side, um, one of the key things here is, yes, um, there is going to be party control leadership. So uh, that means um, the Speaker of the House, the Majority Leader. And so people like Nancy Pelosi, Steny Hoyer, um, are, are actually not only not taking those positions because um, the Democrats lost control of the House, but they're actually not, they're going to step aside and just serve as members and they're making room for the next generation of Democratic leaders to take those roles. So we, it looks very apparent with no opposition that Hakeem Jeffrey, Jeffries of Brooklyn, uh, New York, is going to become the new majority leader. If the Democrats had won, that would have meant Speaker of the House. But um, when they're in the minority, it's, he's going to be the majority leader of the Democrats. Um, and he will also be sharing um, uh, leadership with uh, Catherine Clark, who represents the Boston, Massachusetts area, and Pete Aguilar of the San, Ber San Bernardino. Inland Empire area of California. They will be your top House leaders on the Democratic side. And on the Republican side, um, and by the way, all of those three have an excellent arts voting record. Um, Hakeem Jeffries runs a hip hop um, uh, caucus, which is very cool. He runs a, he does a hip, hip hop um, event every year that is just phenomenal. So you, you have people who have the arts running through their blood. Um, and then on the House side, uh, Kevin McCarthy of California, Steve Scalise of Louisiana will be um, the, speak, the new Speaker of the House and um, the majority leader for Republicans. And there'll be some others as well, but those are the two big names that you need to know. Um, what I can share about this is that neither of them have a good arts voting record. Um, pretty much it's zero in terms of taking pro-arts action on key arts legislation, um, dear colleague letters, uh, co-sponsoring bills that are pro-arts. Um, they have not taken action on any of them. But on the flip side, I wanna remind everyone that not too long ago in, um, in 2016, 17, when the house was controlled by Republicans, the Senate was controlled by Republicans and the White House was controlled by uh, Republican, um, Donald Trump in this case, that the arts actually not only survived, they thrived. Um, there were increases in funding for all of these things. And it has a lot to do with the hard work of bipartisan support that you as grassroots members across the country have been building with both sides both parties, um, both chambers to get support for the arts for them to realize that it is integral to domestic policy in this country. Um, so there's a lot of room to work with and it wasn't that long ago. Um, uh, in the last year of the Trump administration, um, split control of the Senate and yes, it was a democratic controlled house that the largest ever funding bill to help support the arts Shuttered Venue Operator Grant um, was passed with over, with $13 billion, largest ever, $13 billion of COVID relief support to help live arts venues um, get through COVID. Um, and this all happened in a divided government. So um, while there are changes afoot, there are also always opportunities ahead of us. And with that, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Nolan Bivens, who is the president and CEO of Americans for the Arts. Nolan. Thank you so very much, Anita. I trust I'm on screen. 
Well, thanks, Nina, uh, and the uh, entire Americans for the Arts uh, staff and, and contributors on today's call for putting this uh, timely seminar and, and webinar together. Uh, Nina just shared with you some highlights of all the political change that's been happening. I'd like to focus a little bit and just underscore this notion of how change does, in fact, present some opportunities. And particularly, we have opportunities to, I think, uh, move that needle a little bit in about three major areas. One, we have the ability to forge new relationships with elected officials. Nina highlighted the idea of bipartisan. A lot of the efforts that we were able to achieve during COVID were born out of bipartisan relationships. So even though the change is here, we still have the opportunity to develop those new relationships and continue that trend as well. We also have the opportunity to forge uh, advocacy alliances with new partners as well. We saw that happen in the last two crises as well. And we also have the opportunity to forge new and updated messaging uh, points around the agenda that we have out there specifically that come to my mind is arts and healing, loneliness, and also integrating the military families into our communities through an arts to economic impact. And also at the same time, we continue to have the arts economic impact, artists specifically, and elevating the specific role of the BIPOC communities within our uh, arts and cultural sector. Uh, Americans for the Arts and its Arts Action Fund, uh, I would like to let you know, is going to be there to help you seize those opportunities all along the way. We are expanding our grassroots arts advocacy effort. Nina spoke to that. And that's a very key part to us to advance the stories, really your stories and your voices forward in the prominent way. Many times when I talk to congressional leaders, I get great joy in being able to care for your stories, and that's what they want to hear. And so I'm looking to continue to be able to do that as well. And I know that because you all are really the constituents. You're those grassroots community influencers out there. There are over 435 congressional districts, as many of you know, across the 50 states and the six territories that we have, as well as the district. And so we are really uh, compelled to make sure that they understand your voices as a part of this, this story that we're excited to tell as well. I also would like to point out that we want to be a little bit more strategic as well in this pump moment of change and I think the opportunity we have. We want to be strategic about training our art advocates throughout uh, the country as we move forward, doing that with you and at many levels. We want to expand our network of congressional district and state advocacy captains. Again, another major cohort that play leadership roles in this advocacy effort. Couldn't do it without you. And uh, secondly, we also want to have a little bit more strategic idea about organizing some timely fly-ins to bring the grassroots leaders here. It's not just one thing for me to, and my staff to be a part of it, but I'm looking for those opportunities when your compelling voices can come in and be a part of this story here with us as well. And we want to commit resources to allow that to happen as well in support of what you're achieving. And it works the other way around too, particularly as it goes back towards the states. We want to be able to support you as well. And you know, it really doesn't stop there. I want to make sure that we're coming to your communities and, and looking ways to help you organize do advocacy training, meeting with your congressional leaders, as well as the parts that we play here in the Capitol and the federal side. Uh, in 2023, um, also we'll be releasing the results of our economic impact study number six. It's the largest ever. We have over 399 communities that are participating across the country. And most importantly this time, and for the first time, we have important data analysis on all of the BIPOC organizations that are contributing and participating in this study. We set a goal of making that 25% so that we can bring that reality into this economic uh, success story for all of our arts and culture participants. Equity is gonna be a, a critical part of what we do as we go forward. We have a term that we coined here, equitable advocacy, which simply means that we'll be centered in all of our programs, our advocacy gender, internally and throughout the organization externally. We are committed to this term and how we can make sure that everything that we do is done through this lens of equitable advocacy through partnerships, legislative agenda, and also the programmatics that we'll be pursuing. Very, very key point uh, as we move forward. So again, this is a great opportunity, I think, for change. We saw it, we benefited from it during the COVID crisis and all the other issues we went through. We're excited about this and we want to move forward with you in that. So thank you so very much for being here today. And I ask you to continue to support us and we'll support you in all these efforts of advocacy. Thanks again. Thank you, Nolan, for that. Um, 
And um, I would like to now bring on um, the group of federal affairs um, folks who will be Tushar Swain, who's our Director of Policy at Americans for the Arts, Tara Probri, our Advocacy Manager at Americans for the Arts, and the phenomenal Jeremy Johnson, who's the President CEO of Assembly for the Arts. You know, um, as the new Congress comes in, they'll be sworn in on January 3rd, and it will begin the 118th Congress, which will be a two-year cycle. And I'm going to ask Tushar to begin with a deep dive into what changes are ahead in Congress. Tushar? Thank you, Nina, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as Nina mentioned, Republicans will uh, take control uh, of the House on January 3rd, uh, 2023, uh, as the 118th Congress begins. Um, while the narrow victory will uh, likely uh, weaken some Republican political capital, I think you will uh, still see um, and can expect um, some uh, oversight uh, as well as a conservative agenda, uh, which may impede uh, some of the legislative work that uh, Congress uh, works on. Um, I, I should note that uh, there are still um, a few um, uh, races, congressional races yet to be called uh, in California. Uh, there are three uh, races that Republicans uh, right now have the lead, though very narrowly. Uh, in Alaska, uh, Mary Peltola, has, uh, who is the Democrat, actually has a wide lead over um, all Republicans in that race, uh, including Sarah Palin. Um, however, uh, she does not have a majority, uh, and they go through a system called ranked choice voting, uh, which could then take several rounds to actually identify a winner. But we will uh, uh, continue to certainly uh, monitor uh, those races. Uh, right now, Republicans have 218 seats to uh, Democrats, 212. Uh, those, again, are the races uh, that have been called, but more will come up uh, over the course of uh, this week, um, I would suspect. Um, <clears throat> Incumbency mattered in these cases. Um, 365 House districts, um, which faced an incumbent, in which there were 365 House districts in which an incumbent uh, faced re election, and only nine of them lost their seats. So, what does that mean for arts advocacy? Uh, that means for the most part, all of our friends and all of our advocates um, are champions of, of arts legislation, whether it be creative economy legislation or funding initiatives such as uh, NEA, NEH. Um, most, all of those champions are back, so I think that that's good news. Uh, but also we have, sex, uh, we have 74 new House uh, members, 41 in the GOP, 33 um, who are uh, uh, Democrats, uh, they will be coming in. So there will be some uh, fresh new blood. And I think that it's um, uh, pertinent for arts advocates to begin to meet with uh, those members of Congress. Because I think one thing we know for sure, uh, no arts legislation will pass uh, this Congress without bipartisan uh, support. Um, lastly, arts are uh, often the gateway uh, for societal breakthroughs. And so on um, this webinar, I wanted to just take a, a, a quick second to uh, acknowledge some congressional breakthroughs and some notable firsts. And while I don't have time to go through all of them, I will quickly highlight uh, Congressman-elect Maxwell Frost from Florida, um, who on several uh, post-election interviews um, has said that the arts, uh, music, and culture are important to societal um, uh, fixes. So I think that um, it uh, he's going to be a very interesting person um, uh, to watch uh, during this Congress. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. 
So the uh, Congressional Ar Arts Caucus is one of the largest and most active on Capitol Hill, um, and it's central to supporting uh, arts and arts education uh, in the House. Um, there are currently approximately uh, 137 members uh, in the Congressional Arts Caucus. Uh, we will be losing 24 this year due to election losses, retirements, uh, or seeking other offices, 21 Democrats and three Republicans. Uh, we do anticipate that uh, Shelley Pingree from Maine uh, will return as uh, the co-chair. Uh, and then uh, the STEAM caucus, uh, STEAM is an acronym for science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. Uh, and the STEAM caucus will be losing us um, a total of 10 members, uh, seven Democrats and three Republicans. Uh, Co-chair uh, Suzanne Bonamici, who will, we will be hearing from, it's anticipated that she will be returning. Um, <clears throat> one note, uh, the Republican lead of both the Congressional Arts Caucus and the Congressional STEAM Caucus uh, was uh, Representative Elise Stefanik of New York. Um, we uh, anticipate that she will not be returning. And as we um, uh, find out a little bit more information on who will assume those roles, uh, we will uh, certainly report that out to you. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, uh, committee le leadership changes uh, with the flip in the house. Uh, uh, so will be um, uh, power within uh, congressional committees. Um, <clears throat> I have just highlighted uh, several here. There may be more. We may learn of more um, as Congress, um, as the 118th Congress convenes um, on January 3rd. Uh, House Interior Appropriations Subcommittee, highly important because uh, they handle NEA, NEH funding. Uh, David Joyce will be the new chairman, uh, and Shelley Pingree will continue her uh, very important role, but as ranking member. Um, Labor HHS Education Appropriations Subcommittee is a very important committee for arts education, uh, and Tom Cole uh, will um, be the new chairman there, and we expect that Rosa DeLauro uh, will be a ranking member. Uh, both of them seem to, uh, they've been through flips like this before and um, uh, both seem to have a very good working relationship with each other. Uh, one thing to highlight on ways and, ways and means is that uh, Vern Buchanan, uh, who is a co-sponsor of um, the, uh, um, of the uh, performing arts, uh, Tax Parity Act, um, which again is a is a uh, bill that <clears throat> allows for uh, a deduction of arts expenses for creative artists who make uh, one hundred thousand dollars or less. Um, he is actually um, vying for leadership of this committee, so um, we assume that that would be helpful uh, to arts legislation uh, if he uh, does in fact uh, uh, gain the chairmanship. So that's something to keep a, a lookout for. And then education and labor and small business, uh, certainly arts education, uh, uh, education and labor committee is very important, uh, as well as small business for a lot of the creative economy proposals uh, that arts advocates support. Uh, we do have two hardliners um, <clears throat> in terms of the role that uh, federal government uh, should play, both um, within education and within small business, uh, <clears throat> respectively, with um, representatives Virginia Fox and Blake Lutenmeyer. Um, so we will continue, obviously, to uh, uh, make the rounds and uh, uh, with them, but that is just something to uh, note as well. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> Great, I won't spend too much time here because I know uh, Nina went over it, but uh, we are uh, uh, right now in a state of uh, uh, where Democrats hold 50 seats, 
Republicans hold uh, 49. The runoff in Georgia that Nina mentioned is on December uh, 6th. Um, Nina mentioned uh, why that matters, the ability to confirm appointees, a quicker advancement of bills, uh, also creating a buffer vote if, um, uh, if, <laughs> if there is either an illness or a centrist Democrat uh, uh, box at the time of a vote. So I think that um, uh, that kind of spells out uh, why uh, Georgia is still um, incredibly important uh, during this time, uh, as it will, um, again, help uh, determine uh, the makeup of power uh, in the Senate. Next slide. So <clears throat> the Senate Cultural Caucus, uh, unlike um, the uh, Congressional uh, Arts Caucus uh, in the House, We'll see no losses. Um, and Senator Susan Collins and Senator Jack Reed um, are anticipated to remain as co-chairs. Uh, both have been uh, instrumental in uh, and supportive of increased NEA, NEH funding. So uh, we think that that's very good news. Next slide. And here's a list of, um, as of today, the 36 members of the Senate uh, Cultural Caucus. Um, I think it would be uh, a, a good idea for arts advocates, if you don't see your senator um, uh, on this list, to uh, call their office or to send them an email through their website, um, imploring them to be a part of the Senate Cultural Caucus to, so, to show their support. Uh, for all, uh, for arts and culture. Uh, Josh is going to be up a little bit later to uh, give you some tips on uh, how to uh, reach out to your members of Congress this year. Next slide. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so Senate appropriations. Uh, I think that the Senate Appropriations Committee is where you're going to see the biggest change. Um, for um, uh, for particularly for arts funding, uh, Senator Patty Murray of Washington um, will be the new chairwoman of the committee, um, taking over for a retiring uh, Patrick Leahy of Vermont, and chair and and ranking member excuse me ranking member Susan Collins uh, will be taking over for a retiring Richard Shelby of Alabama. Um, both have uh, ha have shown support for both uh, NEA and NEH funding, um, as well as uh, uh, increases in arts education funding over the last four years. So we consider that to be good news. And then in the Senate uh, Help Committee, Help stands for Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions. Uh, Senator Bernie Sanders uh, has, <clears throat> it's been reported that he ha has indicated interest in being the new chairman of the HELP committee. Um, Senator Rand Paul is in line to become the ranking member uh, with a departing um, uh, Richard Burr from North Carolina. Um, the issue here is, is that Senator Paul would like um, some Senate oversight power, uh, and the Senate Help Committee doesn't offer that to him. So it's been uh, uh, it, it it it's been reported that he is looking for a Senate oversight uh, position and may forego um, this. Uh, this ranking membership, but of course we will uh, continue to report out there as we hear more. Uh, next slide, please. And then quickly, just a quick uh, shift to um, lame duck session. Uh, Congress is back to finish its work uh, with the main goal of funding uh, the government by December 16th to avoid a federal government shutdown. Uh, for arts advocacy, we are watching uh, the Department of Interior funding. Uh, the House of Representatives passed uh, its Interior Appropriations Bill at $207 million, which is $27 million above last year's uh, number. Uh, <clears throat> Senate Democrats released draft language of its appropriations uh, bills back in the summer. 
uh, and it only listed NEA and NEH funding at $195 million. Uh, dollars. Um, arts advocates are, of course, rallying around the $207 million number. Uh, we think this is a good step toward a dollar per capita funding for the NEA and NEH, uh, which right now only funds about 54 cents uh, per American. Uh, next slide. And so uh, here is a voter voice campaign that Americans for the Arts and um, American Action Fund um, uh, created for you as a um, arts advocate to contact your member of Congress uh, to again support that $207 million number that would be a $27 million increase uh, over last year um, at a time when the arts community uh, really needs it the most uh, coming post pandemic. Next slide. And then finally, um, uh, we're not sure if there's going to be a tax bill uh, during lame duck session. Uh, we know that Democrats and Republicans are trying to coalesce around uh, R&D and tax, uh, child tax credit extensions. Um, the, uh, if, it, if they do try to pass something, the legislation would have a narrow focus, but there are several items in play and uh, important to the arts. I'll just quickly mention the first two um, <clears throat> in the interest of time. Uh, the Performing Arts, uh, the Performing Artists Parity and Tax Act, PATBA, which I mentioned earlier, uh, that uh, Congressman uh, Vern Buchanan uh, was a Republican co-sponsor for. Uh, it's actually been introduced on the House side by Judy Chu, and then on the Senate side by Senator Mark Warner, and again provides um, a qualified de uh, a deduction for um, artists' expenses for um, those making $100,000 or less. And then uh, the universal charitable deduc deduction, um, looking to reinstate that. Uh, so non itemizers can take um, at least a $300 uh, deduction for, um, uh, for charitable giving. Uh, this expired back in 2021. And so we are looking to um, try and reinstate that as well. Next slide, please. And that's all for me for now. Thank you, Tushar. Um, I'm going to now ask Jeremy Johnson to join us. Jeremy is from Cleveland, Ohio, and we've mentioned um, that Congressman David Joyce is going to be taking over, likely, uh, chairmanship of the House Interior Appropriations Committee. So Jeremy, all eyes will go on Cleveland now. <laughs> They've moved from Portland, Maine, where um, Shelly Pingree was, and now they're moving to Cleveland, Ohio. Um, tell us, um, uh, we know that um, David Joyce has a great arts voting, voting record in committee. He's said great things, but tell us about the relationship he has with Cleveland and the arts. Well, first off, Nina, thanks for having me. It's great to be around so many smart people in educating us on the state of our, 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 our federal government and, and these programs. I can tell you, Clevelanders, greater Clevelanders and those from Northeast Ohio are really excited about uh, Representative Joyce's leadership. Uh, he's been on the Appropriations Committee prior and now that he's slated to be chair of the Interior House uh, Appropriations Committee, we, we are thrilled because he's no stranger to uh, being an art supporter and Ohio being that state where, um, uh, where we, are, uh, we are both sides of the aisle uh, and we are really thrilled to be working with him. I can tell you at Assembly for the Arts, we're the Regional Arts Council for Northeast Ohio that our primary uh, lobbyist advocates, they are also very close and have worked for years with uh, Representative Joyce we are, are just really um, looking forward to working across the aisle and especially to support uh, the representatives work to uh, forward arts and culture and the creative economy. Uh, so we're really thrilled about that. And um, I'm still, uh, full disclosure, I'm still, I'm from Cleveland, but I've returned to Cleveland, been here a year and a half, and I'm so thrilled 
to be uh, re-establishing these relationships with our federal uh, our federal delegation. Jeremy, um, Nolan talked about also creating new talking points for this new change in Congress. And I know that you are one of the leaders in the new economic impact six study. How will that play a role? This will be enormous. And I am shaking the trees here in Northeast Ohio because this is the first time that Greater Cleveland has participated in the Arts and Economic Prosperity Six study. It's a bit of a mouthful, AEP Six, but it's gonna be a true game changer for Cleveland and the 399 cities. And let me tell you why. We are constantly, as everybody on this, this call knows, we are constantly making the economic case for the arts. This will be the first national study with economic numbers that we will be able to take to our congressional leaders and our state leaders and local leaders as well to look at the economic impact of the arts. And furthermore, let me share, and I don't want to uh, jump the gun here or steal the thunder, but many of the people on this call know this study includes a special emphasis on the role of BIPOC organizations and BIPOC audiences and how they influence on our influence by uh, the arts and the cultural, the creative economy. We are so thrilled that we will be able to bring that data. We talked a lot about data. We will be able to bring that data back to our elected officials and say, here are the numbers, the most recent numbers as we come out of what I call the before time, the pandemic. So this is gonna be critical not just for Northeast Ohio, but for the country. Thank you. The timing couldn't be more perfect to have you as a leader in Cleveland and having that economic impact study coming out in 2023, in the fall of 2023, I'm hearing early October. Um, so thank you. And we'll be on speed dial. Absolutely. <laughs> um, thank next, you, Gina. <laughs> next, um, I'd like to bring on Tara Proby to pick up on that thread of what Jeremy was talking about, of having this focus on equity and diversity issues in the economic impact plan. And now she's um, our lead person on our legislative agenda and diversity. Tara. Thank you, Nina. So um, in terms of diversity, equity and inclusion goals uh, within an advocacy context, Americans for the Arts is currently monitoring as well as creating legislation that advances DEI in the arts and arts education. We're also working to advance our existing DEI efforts within federal agencies such as the National Endowment for the Arts. And another way that we're working to advance diversity, equity, and inclusion goals um, when it relates to the arts is by creating pipeline opportunities for diverse communities. So an example of this would be trying to establish um, a pipeline program with various um, arts and humanities departments at different universities for diverse students. Next slide, please. So when it comes to legislation um, and some of the bills that we're monitoring, we are currently monitoring Congresswoman Barbara Lee's Advancing Equity Through the Arts and Humanities Act of uh, 2022. This is a bill that was introduced by the Congresswoman in April of this year. And essentially it works to address inequity in the arts and humanities by providing NEA funding to BIPOC led organizations. Um, as with anything else that we've mentioned on this call, in order to advance this legislation, it does require bipartisan support. So given the current congressional landscape, we're asking advocates to really um, foster relationships um, with both parties, Republican and Democrat members of Congress. Next slide, please. So another issue um, that falls within the DEI frame, and this is also an arts education issue, is arts and juvenile justice. And the way that we're working to advance this um, goal is primarily working with the arts and juvenile justice working group. 
This is a group comprised of community stakeholders and nonprofit organizations that are dedicated to advocating for creative arts therapies being integrated into the juvenile justice system. This year, one of our uh, major actions when it comes to arts and juvenile justice was meeting with Liz Ryan, who serves as the administrator of the Department of Justice's Office of Delinquency Juvenile Justice Prevention. And really the purpose of this meeting was to discuss um, fiscal year 23 appropriations funding. And one of the things that Americans for the Arts asked for with our colleagues in the Arts and Juvenile Justice Working Group was for a funding level of no less than $5 million to go towards the newly established Arts and Juvenile Justice Demonstration Program to advance arts integration into diversion, prevention, reentry, and secure detention juvenile justice programs in the form of funding uh, to service providers and researchers. And again, just reinforcing um, how this works into the current congressional landscape. We are asking advocates to you know, reach across the aisle and um, collaborate with both parties, Republican and Democrat, to get that bipartisan support and move the needle forward on these initiatives. And that's it for my section. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tara. And I'm going to ask you to stay on and bring on your bring back your colleagues uh, Tushar and Jeremy um, for a Q&A session. And before I begin the Q&A, Q &A, I wanna just mention a couple of things. People have asked for links and copies of the PowerPoint slides. We posted it a couple of times, but I want you to know it's already been posted on the ArtsU resource section of uh, the webinar. And um, I believe that they'll post it again in the chat right now. So you don't have to worry about it. those live links within each slide will be there. Um, I wanted to clarify when Tushar was talking about Representative Stefanik not coming back. It's not that she's not coming back to Congress, but she won't be returning as the co-chairs of those two caucuses, the STEAM caucus and the arts caucus. And in fact, she's elevating to a very high level within the party and becoming the chair of the Republican Steering Committee. And what that's what the title of that committee doesn't say is how important it is because this is the policy agenda um, that the Republican House Party um, uh, gets involved in in determining what their platforms are. So a previous co-chair of the Arts Caucus and the STEAM Caucus is quite significant. That is now the chair of the Republican Steering Committee in the House. Um, okay, so now I'm going to the Q&A. And we're going to start off with a question from my friend Sam Waterston that's been upvoted several times. And it is, what are the prospects for and best vehicles for getting workforce development dollars to the creative industries and creative workforce? And how does the election impact support the PLACE and CREATE Acts? Tushar, you want to take that first? Sure. Um... It's a very good question. I think that you know you first have to start off with um, with the thought that uh, with this Congress, um, with the 118th Congress coming up, that you're going to need bipartisan um, support. Uh, and the Create Act actually did on the Senate side; um, it failed to uh, to garner that bipartisan support uh, on the House side. Uh, and so I think that you know work is going to you have to is going to have to be done to uh, uh, to try and shore up uh, a couple of Republicans um, on the House side. I think that you know we've also been told um, by uh, uh, by members of the Small Business Committee um, that we should also kind of have a two pronged uh, parallel approach, doing whatever we can to pass um, uh, uh, workforce, um, workforce provisions within Congress, uh, but also working with the Department of Labor at an agency level uh, to see what we can do on the regulatory side uh, as well. And Sam, I will also contribute to this answer to say that um, I think we should take a um, take the model that Neva created 
with getting SWOG supported in a bipartisan, bicameral way. Um, and that especially with these jobs bills, I think it's going to take an effort of not just the nonprofit arts community, but the for-profit arts community that the NEVA folks represent, that you folks represent, um, coming together strongly in a united way to make this happen. I think it's quite possible. Nina, I'm going to jump in there to uh, yes, echo Jeremy. your comments to Sean, um, who hails from Cleveland, Ohio, by the way, uh, and, and, and helped to lead that, that huge NEVA effort. Working across these uh, agencies, especially the, the workforce agencies, uh, labor, uh, in my former work in New Jersey, uh, working with then Mayor Cory Booker, there was huge investment with across the aisle through, uh, through the labor department, the federal labor department. We have ways to do more of that, uh, certainly with arts and culture, for-profit and non-profit uh, creative sectors. So just wanted to chime in on that. Sure. Um, and then um, one more question is, is there any risk to the president's United We Stand support for the NEA, NEH, and AmeriCorps to invest in the arts as a strategy for placemaking and further social cohesion? That would probably, Tushar, do you have anything on that one? Um, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question again? I didn't Sure. Um, is there any risk to the president's United We Stand support for the NEA, NEH, and AmeriCorps to invest in the arts as a strategy for placemaking and social cohesion? Un, um, I mean, my personal opinion uh, is no. I know that that can, you know, potentially be uh, a scene as 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 politically uh, loaded uh, in some sense, but um, you know, I think. Uh, you know, I think as arts advocates, um, we need to uh, to continue to take a stand on on some of these uh, important issues, and so um, so I commend him for doing so. Um, and I would just like to add um, the creation through executive order of the new president's committee on the arts and humanities has a very specific focus on equity issues, and especially I can see it taking on the issues of United We Stand. Now, um, the committee members have not been appointed yet, but you should know that they do not need Senate confirmation. So I'm hoping that that's going to be happening soon. Um, I do believe that they have an executive director, at least in the background, um, beginning work. And I think that it could be very strong on these issues. And that I believe the artists, um, that the president does see the arts as um, part of the solution in these hate crimes and other things. Tara, is there anything you want to add before we move on to the next panel? Okay, great. Okay, thank you, panelists. Um, and now um, I'd like to introduce with our slide um, the next group that we'll be having come on, which it will be on state and local issues. So we'll have um, from Americans for the Arts, Jay Dick, um, uh, and then uh, Senior Director of State and Local Government Affairs, uh, Josh Reynolds, Government Affairs Coordinator, Americans for the Arts, and then our two outside uh, wonderful member guests, Tom DeCaney um, with Create California and Patrick McWhorter with Arizona Citizens for the Arts. Jay, why don't you go ahead and take it away? Thanks, Dina. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm going to do a quick overview of the states along with how it will uh, possibly affect the uh, the arts in your state. So buckle up, we're in for a quick little 10 minutes here. So every four years, there's a major election in, at the state level and 2022 was that year. 36 governors were up for re-election, re 88 of the 99 uh, legislative chambers were up in 46 states and 85% of all legislators were up for election. Uh, with all the potential focus of a, of a tidal wave, the state elections actually from a historical perspective didn't really change too much. And we'll find out here why. Next slide. Uh, as I stated, there was, you know, uh, gubernatorial elections were held in 36 states and three territories uh, this year with 31 incumbent governors eligible to uh, for re-election, which left eight, uh, leaving for another, another uh, job out there. Pre-election, we had 22 Democratic governors and 28 Republican governors. Uh, this time around, uh, the Democrats actually picked up two seats and the Republicans lost two, 
assuming that you see a Florida, or I'm sorry, Alaska has not been colored in, that's going to stay in the Republican hands with a, a Governor Mike Dunleavy getting reelected. Um, Republicans, though, also picked up in Nevada, a surprise, as everyone knows, with Governor uh, Sisolak, who lost to uh, Republican Joe Lombardo. Uh, Democrats also did some interesting things. They picked up really narrowly in Arizona, and I know Patrick Piper will talk a little bit about that, in Maryland and in Massachusetts. So overall, we have a 24-26 split uh, with our governors. That's closer than it's been in decades, and so we're, we're right on the, on, the, on, the, on the path there. Uh, next slide, please. We talk about uh, about uh, trifectas at the state level government. That's when one party controls uh, both uh, the House, the Senate, and the gubernatorial seat uh, in each state. Uh, the election this year puts Democrats at 17 uh, trifectas. That's up three from uh, last time. Republicans are down to 21 states. That's minus two. And the number of divided states is down to 10, which is minus three. Um, the Republicans' numbers should go up uh, one with Alaska as it comes through, and maybe even New Hampshire. Uh, but Democrats picked up uh, Massachusetts, Maryland, Michigan, and Minnesota, but lost Nevada, uh, while the Re Re uh, Republican Party lost Arizona. I should also note, just because you have a trifecta, or uh, you uh, uh, don't have a trifecta, doesn't mean there's things going on. In Kansas and Kentucky, um, they have a Democratic governor but they have a veto-proof supermajority of the Republican Party in this case. So uh, it's almost like a trifecta uh, in, in these states. Uh, and you see more and more of, of this happening there. Again, the most divided the nation's been since uh, the 1800s. Red is redder and blue is bluer. Uh, next slide. Let's do some interesting facts here. Um, women in the legislature uh, didn't change much with this election, uh, about 30% of all uh, of the 7,000 uh, legislators are women. Uh, of interesting Florida, Kentucky uh, women are mostly of the Republican Party. Uh, oftentimes we don't think that, but uh, that's certainly the case here. Delaware, Florida, Nebraska is states where the most gains happen uh, for women legislators. Um, governor's offices, 12 women are now governors. That's 24% of all governors. So again, you're seeing some, some a little bit of growth there. That's an all-time record uh, with that too. Uh, next slide. Women will also, for the first time, uh, serve simultaneously as governor and lieutenant governor in two states, Arkansas and Massachusetts. Please forgive Maryland there. I have a little typo there. But in Maryland, Governor-elect Wes Moore, and I found this hard to believe, becomes only the third Black governor in the United States' history, of all states, third Black governor. Um, in uh, Maryland, the governor joins the, the lieutenant governor, attorney general, and comptroller uh, are the only people of color, or are, are all people of color, uh, first, again, for any state. So again, we're seeing a lot of of equity and inclusion issues going on. And then of course, there's hundreds of new uh, legislators uh, around that we're gonna get to know. Uh, next slide. So in, um, as I said, mentioned, uh, mentioned about veto-proof majorities, half the states now, up from 21, over half the states now will have veto-proof majorities, both red uh, and, uh, and blue there. Um, 17 uh, in uh, Republicans, veto-proof majorities, and nine uh, in the Democrats. You can see which states uh, pick, uh, pick those up there. Um, but, you know, there's opportunity. So this is where the, the arts really have a chance to, to step in and shine. There's at least 30 new, 32 new chamber leaders, meaning Senate presidents, speakers of the houses, things along those lines, um, that um, you have new opportunities. Uh, so make sure that you're building these relationships. Just because they have a D or an R behind their name doesn't mean that they're automatically going to uh, support or oppose uh, the arts and culture. So get to know them and make sure that you're educating them. So in addition to those 32 new leaders there, uh, we have uh, nine new governors and 16 new lieutenant governors. Get to know them, uh, educate them about why the arts matter to their states. And then we have multiple new committee chairs. So, you know, appropriations committee chairs, education committee chairs, things like that. Again, all these new opportunities that you as state, uh, as state arts advocates can be out there working to make sure that you're educating uh, them to have positive arts, uh, arts venues, uh, arts opportunities out there. Next slide. I wanna call out a really great example of bipartisan arts support. Uh, in Florida, Jennifer Jones of the Florida Cultural uh, uh, Coalition down there uh, was a big part of this. Um, in Florida, this last year, um, a bipartisan group of legislators led by the four down here uh, appropriated $59 million to fund Florida's cultural programs and projects. This is an all-time high. Now, keep in mind, this is a Republican-led legislature uh, with a Republican governor. 
but they went in, they said, well, here's why the arts matter to the uh, to the citizens of Florida, why it really is uh, an important bipartisan issue. So you see these four representatives, representatives uh, 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 Anna Ekomani, Carlos Merrill Smith, Jay Trumbull, and Javier Williamson, two Democrats, two Republicans. They are actually going to sneak peek, get our 2022 Public Leadership in the Arts Award uh, this year for their bipartisan work in Florida. So think about bipartisan. We have a lot of single uh, controlled legislators out there. You have to work with the party in control. The arts are great bipartisans and you can do this. Next slide, please. Um, some, some other takeaways uh, here. Uh, state budgets for next year uh, are estimated to be increasing by 4.2%. This is actually down from 16.5% in 2022 when they were spending ARPA funds. So combine this with governors of both parties have collectively called for approximately $15 billion in tax cuts the historic appropriations for state arts agencies could be in danger. So again, advocates, you need to be out there working with the uh, the political parties there to say, you know, hey, the arts are really important to our economy. Do not cut the arts as budgets. If anything, you know, uh, uh, give them an increase there. So we have really big, you know, potential issues given, you know, where we're at with, with the budgets there. Uh, next slide. I've already talked about uh, budgets and tax cuts, but infrastructure. So, you know, we certainly have um, uh, a lot of building going on with the ARPA funds. Uh, there's a lot of uh, ways that the arts can be part of that, uh, that process there too with uh, cultural enhancements or transportation enhancements. So how can we be working with them? Uh, mental health is, a, uh, in, uh, is, is certainly gonna be uh, something that's going on here. Medicaid spending is going to be down to 0.8%, we estimate from 10%, 10 so a lot of big, big decrease there. Um, and so there's less money for, um, there, there could be less money for other programs like the arts because they're gonna to have to spend it more on, on the Medicaid there. Uh, but the also potential pro, uh, uh, focus here or positive is that arts and mental health care is something that's gonna get more and more attention out there. And so I think that's a great area at the state level to be uh, talking about, uh, to making sure that, uh, hey, the arts are really part of the solution here. Workforce development and education are always areas where the arts are, are uh, play a role there. So again, we're gonna see stuff like this. And then stuff that Tara's mentioned, uh, civil uh, justice. And so using the arts to promote equitable reforms. I'm hearing this over and over again in states red and blue that they're looking to do civil justice reform. And so that's a big part for the arts there. Uh, next slide. Uh, I was recently at an event uh, with a panel of bipartisan uh, legislative leaders and some of the things that they brought up here, you see this, this list, uh, mental health, affordable health, inflation. Um, notice the arts aren't on here, but the arts overlap with a lot of these cases, even fentanyl drug use, how the arts can help with opioid addictions or things along those lines. So lots of great ways uh, to, to work with that. Um, next slide. So what do you think the state leaders don't wanna to touch? What are those third rails, you know? Uh, it's interesting. Um, the Republicans were talking about we do not want to tighten abortion regulations and we do not want to uh, talk about expanding gun rights. They're tired of those uh, those issues there. Democrats are tired of talking about sports bet uh, betting and climate change. Uh, and then everyone is like no data privacy and no raising taxes. So it's interesting to see what they uh, do not want to be talking about. They just want to get down to legislating uh, things that uh, truly that are uh, most people care about. Uh, next slide. That was a really quick overview of legislative stuff. Uh, I want to talk quickly about ballot initiatives before we talk. Uh, bring Tom on here. Uh, this year, there's 136 uh, ballot in, uh, initiatives on on the ballot. That's down from 172. So we're seeing it continued uh, going down. There's two types of ballot measures: citizens led, uh, legislative led, and citizens led. We'll talk about that in a second. There's there was only 39 citizen uh, initiatives uh, this year. That's down, uh, cons you know, conceptually over the last few years. So you're seeing less and less state ballot initiatives, but those that are out there, two thirds pass, and this is holding fairly consistently. So as most uh, ballot initiatives are sponsored by the state legislature, consider you know, uh, trying to get a, an arts ballot initiative like Tom did in, in, uh, in uh, California there, or like Minnesota's legacy amendment that uh, uh, appropriates dollars for uh, the legislature there. Uh, next slide. You can see that from this, uh, who, which states do, does what, um, every state has some form of a ballot question. The gray states, only the legislature can do it. In the orange states, like California, citizens can uh, uh, propose ballot initiatives, but the legislature can also do it. And in New Mexico and Maryland, 
only uh, they can only do by citizen initiative. So there's another way of going about getting uh, change. It doesn't have to just be through the legislature. Uh, next slide, please. Some of the more interesting uh, parts uh, of the ballot initiatives um, were um, abortion, uh, tobacco, marijuana, and civil uh, justice reform. These are all areas that are equitable advocacy opportunities for us. So how can we be promoting, uh, you know, what, through maybe a reduced mandatory minimums uh, or things like that, uh, more equitable solutions for our, 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 our citizens out there. Uh, next slide. Um, we're quickly, local ballot initiatives. Don't really, you know, there's really no database for this, but I uh, want to talk about one of them really quick and then uh, turn it over to Tom. In Miami Beach, there was a bond initiative, Yes to Arts, passed with 65% of the, the budget there. $159 million for bonds and cultural for cultural institutions. Um, the idea is they want to rebrand Miami Beach away from a party destination to the home for arts and culture. And I think that's wonderful. So if your city or county has had any local initiative, please you know, send me an email. I'd love to highlight those and learn about those and put them in our database. So next slide. That was a really quick rundown of what's going on. I'm now going to be very happy to bring Tom on uh, to the camera here uh, to talk about California Prop 28. I won't steal his thunder. So Tom, thank you very much for being with us and please take it away, sir. Well, thank you, Jay. And thank you so much for having me today. Um, my name is Tom DeCaney. I'm the executive director of Create California. And we're the arts, uh, arts education policy and advocacy organization dedicated to making sure that every California student gets a well-rounded education that includes the visual and performing arts um, and in their curriculum. Uh, and we're celebrating. So uh, Prop 28 was a voter initiative. As Jay mentioned, it was put on the ballot as a citizen's initiative. Um, I'm just going to give an overview of the, the measure, and then I'll talk a little bit about how we got here and how the measure came to be on the ballot. Um, so Prop 28 passed over, overwhelmingly with 64% of California voters voting in, voting in favor. So for a, for a California measure, that's a pretty significant majority. Um, Prop 28 will require an ongoing annual source of funding for K-12 public schools for visual and performing arts education equal to, at a minimum, 1% of the total state and local revenues that local education agencies receive every year under Prop 98. So in California, we have another voter measure called Prop 98 that sets a baseline for local education agency funding and Prop 28 will be 1% of that in any given year. So it will fluctuate year to year, which was part of its uh, traction and why it received no organized opposition. Um, but we anticipate in fiscal year 23 that that'll be about 800 million to $1 billion total. That said, California is a very large state. So you have to remember that we have 5.9 million public school students in California. Uh, that said, this is no short of a historic moment for arts education funding in California. And we believe it may be the largest allocation for arts education funding in the United States. Um, there is a equity weighted formula to the distribution of the funds. Funds will be distributed annually by the California Department of Education on a per student allocation at the site level. Um, and there is a weighted formula for low income students. Uh, we don't know exactly what the allocation will be in the first year of implementation, but we envision it'll range between $141 per student at the base level and $160 per student on the weighted equity formula end. Again, that, those numbers are slated to shift depending on final revenues and the total Prop 98 allocation for education funding. Um, the funds are restricted to go to 80% of the funds are required to go to personnel. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm getting over a cold here. Um, so any school that has 50, 500 or more students um, will be required to spend 80% or more on personnel. So that includes credentialed visual and performing arts teachers, certificated staff, and teacher aides. Uh, the remaining 20% is available for supplies and materials, um, arts provider partnerships, um, and any other uh, uses that the school site might use as long as it's restricted to arts education. There is a do not supplant clause. Um, we're working through some of the nuances of what that'll look like, but it is, does not allow a school site to supplant any existing arts education funding. And that was a critical part of the measure um, to make sure that we didn't undermine any existing funding. Um, and up to 1% of funds are available for administrative costs. Um, and there is a waiver clause that will allow the state superintendent of public instruction uh, to offer waivers to any school site 
um, for various reasons. Uh, the first main reason we anticipate will be the teacher shortage. Uh, we anticipate this will be about a 50% increase to total visual and performing arts teachers in the state of California, which is historic, uh, but those teachers just don't exist. So our next big, big task is to be um, feeding the teacher pipeline in California. Um, and those waivers we imagine will go to things like uh, perhaps waiting for schools to be able to find the credential teachers they need to fill that 80% requirement. Um, just a little bit about how the campaign started. It was introduced by Austin Butner, who is the former superintendent of LA Unified School District. Um, he partnered with Fender Musical Instruments to start the signature gathering for getting it onto the ballot. Uh, Create California was one of the first organizations to endorse and was an ongoing partner in the work. Uh, but the actual initiative was led by Austin Butner um, and a coalition. Uh, they spent a total of about $9.2 million to get it on the ballot and get it passed. Uh, it was a little bit more than initially was the goal for fundraising, um, but the major contributors, contributors included $4.27 million from Austin Butner himself. So we have a lot to thank to Austin Butner for both initiating the measure, but also funding it. Um, other major contributors included the California Teacher Association at $2 million, Stephen Ballmer at $1.5 million, Fender Musical Instruments at $1.2 million, and Monica Rosenthal, who some of you may know as the actress from Everybody Loves Raymond, at $1 million. So it really was an entertainment industry, Los Angeles-based funding mechanism that really supported the voter initiative. Um, so we're incredibly grateful to them, and we're going to be their partners in making sure implementation has the fidelity we all hope for. So uh, thanks so much, Jay, for inviting me, and I'll be looking forward to helping and answer any questions. Oh, Jay, you might be muted there. Do this for several years. I forget this. Tom, thank you so much. We appreciate all the work you're doing in California. Next up, we have uh, Patrick Mahorner of the Arizona Citizens. A few interesting things going on in Arizona. So love to, to hear a little bit more about your take, Patrick. You're, and you're muted too, sir. Boy, I tell you what, uh, I had to click two buttons. Uh, it's great to be with all of you today. Um, I come from uh, perhaps uh, what is maybe the most purple state in the nation, I guess, the way we talk about these things with colors, because uh, we we saw some very uh, mixed results in our election. So uh, to some extent, people know more about uh, what's happened with the counting of the ballots in Arizona than probably just about any state. We've been all over the national headlines. I will tell you, while we have been sitting on this webinar, they actually just dropped the last 1,300 ballots in the statewide election. Uh, they have finished counting uh, every ballot. Um, there is uh, now going to be a, a period of recount because we have some races that are so close. Our attorney general's race out of two and a half million ballots cast is uh, the Democratic candidate leads by 510 votes. Um, this was the fourth highest turnout in a midterm election since 1974 in Arizona. The turnout was 62.5% of the uh, uh, registered voters, uh, and the total number of ballots cast, two and a half million, is uh, almost the number that was cast for president in, 19, in 2016. So the first uh, uh, part of the story here in Arizona is that we have uh, we have seen an incredible amount of money spent on the elections. Uh, our Senate race that has received so much attention, there was well over $100 million spent on the races here. And um, nothing like that has never, ever been spent on any statewide races in Arizona in the past. Um, the other thing that was happening with our elections is we, uh, just like everywhere, we were looking at the first elections after redistricting. Now we have an independent redistricting commission here. Uh, nonetheless, uh, there was a bit of a Republican leaning emphasis in the way the districts were redrawn this decade. And so that's why our congressional de delegation, which was five Democrats and four Republicans flipped and it's now five Republicans and four Democrats. Uh, I will tell you that one of the seats was an open uh, district um, and the new Republican Congressman Juan Siscomani is actually a very reasonable Republican to work with. And I was in a civic leadership program with him in 2011. So I know him very well. And um, so if you need any help with the new representative uh, Siscomani, let me know. Uh, and then finally, I will come to the implications of all of this for the arts because at the state level, 
the state legislative level and our state government level, uh, we have a historic circumstance. Uh, we have a Democratic governor, uh, which by the way, this is the first time since 1948 that Arizona has two Democratic US senators and a Democratic governor. By the way, our governor won with a landslide of 17,000 votes out of two and a half million cast. I call that a landslide because of course, uh, President Biden won the state uh, two years ago with that landslide of 10,000. So uh, you, you can see all of our elections are very close here and that's the story. But we are still very divided. The state legislature remains a GOP controlled legislature with a one vote margin in both the House and the Senate. And one of the things that means for us is that uh, we, we will probably see uh, Democrats writing the state budget again this year, uh, which they basically did last year because the Republicans couldn't get their votes together on their own. And this time we have a Democratic governor who has to sign the final budget. This past year, we secured the highest ever amount for the State Arts Commission, $5 million. Uh, we'll be seeking at least that, if not more, the incoming governor made a personal promise to me several months ago of putting at least $10 million into her budget request for the State Arts Commission. So we're hopeful that the fact that Democrats will be very influential in writing the budget this year means that we will have another good year for funding for our Arts Commission. And that's, uh, that's kind of a, a quick summary. Uh, there's a lot of nuance uh, in all of that, but uh, be happy to cover it in questions. Jay, you're on mute. Second time I've done that. Oh my gosh, thanks, Dina. Uh, let's switch over to uh, Josh uh, here at American Express to talk about what we should be doing between now and the election day. Josh, go ahead. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Jay, and thank you to our wonderful speakers. It's so lovely to be here with you guys. Um, so yeah, I'm here to talk about what you can be doing as an advocate starting yesterday, really. Um, so right off the bat, let's talk about, you know, who to engage. Um, you need to connect with your new and returning elected officials from every level of government, that being your local city council person, your mayor, all the way up through your senator and the executive uh, federal office. Um, and you should be doing this now. You don't need to wait until swearing in, especially if it's a, a new member to Congress or your state legislature. They're most likely be sworn in in January, but you they still will have their campaign emails active. And um, you can find this time to and I'll touch on this a little bit later, but maybe invite them to any holiday parties or any sort of event you have currently during this time of year to kind of start building that relationship. Likewise, you can encourage your friends, relatives, members of your organizations to find their elected officials via online tools. Um, Congress has a good tool to find your federal elected members. Uh, mostly, I think every single state uh, will have some sort of find my legislator webpage. And you just use your address or zip code and you can find exactly who uh, represents you. And then as well, usually links to their contact pages um, so you can start building out those relationships. And this is really important. Not only do you want to reach the members themselves, but if they have staff, really start to build those um, important relationships with staff. Uh, Jay and I were at an event last week where some state elected officials were speaking and everyone echoed the sentiment that if you don't treat their staff well, or you don't acknowledge their staff or representations of the member, that's a non-starter and you're not gonna even have them in the room to have a conversation with them. And especially district staff, um, some members even want to prefer you meet with them in their home offices, especially if they're from rural communities, way before you meet them in a state capital or in Washington, DC. So it's about building those authentic uh, relationships quickly and earnestly. And lastly, sign up for some newsletters and follow them on social media so you get to know them. Um, and also, you should know that you don't want to assume that they know any as much about the arts and culture as you do. You are the subject matter experts. Um, so do some research on them, see if they have any backgrounds in the arts or their family does. And that can kind of help you get your foot in the door. Um, a lot of times, especially if it's a new member or you think that they aren't as um, inclined to be an art supporter, but also know that they rely on their constituents to make these informed decisions, especially at a state and local level, because like I mentioned before, they might have a small uh, or no staff at all. So they really need you to help bring them the hard data, which 
Americans for the Arts and other organizations provide, as well as there's no good data without a good story. So you have that personal connection and that touch to really drive the, the point home. All right, so now let's look at a timetable for advocacy. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's talk about some key dates for federal advocacy. As Tushar mentioned earlier, uh, the Georgia Senate runoffs is December 6th, so we'll be eyeing that closely. January 3rd, 2023 is the swearing in day for the 118th Congress. Um, we anticipate that around March 2023, the administration budget recommendations will be sent out to Congress. And then from May through June, we'll really start to see the House of Representatives uh, Appropriations Subcommittee to start to mark up their bills for the NEA, uh, NEA and IOMOS funds. So those are really, really important. Let's uh, stay up, on, up to date on that, as well as state advocacy. Uh, there's approximately only about seven year round legislatures on a state level. So most session, sessions will begin early January uh, and most set and a majority of them will also be out by the end of summer. So not only do some of these people have small staff, they're also working on a huge time constraint. So again, trying to get your foot in the door as soon as possible is really, really important to help. So when it's February and they have to move fast on a bill to support the arts in your state, you're not just talking to them the first time. It's, hey, I saw you at my holiday party or something along the lines of that. And then also the uh, your local elections are ongoing and the, those calendars are most likely gonna be year round as well and easily accessible from um, your municipal databases. So be sure to stay up on that. Next slide, please. And lastly, let's talk about how to engage with your elected officials. So um, everybody can use uh, the voter voice uh, grassroots software that Americans for the Arts has um, on our webpage, as well as the Arts Action Fund to send messages to Congress and your elected officials. But also we, you really should uh, be sending congratulatory letters, preferably a handwritten letter. Uh, but if not, just make sure that you address them personally and you introduce yourself as well as your organization or who you represent or who you are in the arts and culture creative sector uh, to let them know that you you represent them and you uh, or they represent you and that you are happy to be in their district and happy to have this facilitation for um, a productive uh, relationship. You can also join the Arts Action Fund, become a member and stay up to date with any news blasts with that. We, if you do not run a local arts agency or uh, any sort of advocacy organization at a state level, I, we encourage you to find those who are active in your community and build that coalition and show some support and uh, find ways to advocate that way. Like I mentioned, send some congratulatory letters and then invite elected officials to events early and often. I'm really, really gonna hit, hit this uh, as well because even if they can't come, this is an opportunity for a staff member to show up. I, I was former legislative staff and I really was flattered when I got to attend in my member's stead. And it, you can still build those relationships and it just, you'd be surprised how many people would actually show up to a monthly lunch for your organization if you send them enough notice. Um, as well as, you know, ask any key new members to request specific committee assignments if you're pretty engaged and you know which uh, committees in your state or Congress act on the arts. If you have a champion, ask them to be included in those committee assignments and put their name forward for that. And also if you have an arts advocacy day it will, at any level of government, be sure to let them know early and remind them often that that is happening. And those are our tips and tricks to get engaged. And Thank I think now we're gonna to move to the q and yeah. Thank you, Josh. Um, and I'm going to ask your colleagues, Jay and Patrick, and Tom to come back online. And the first question is for Tom DeCaney. Um, and the question is from Cynthia Chen, who asks, how can arts advocates be helpful in engaging in public policy implementation? For example, now that Prop 28 has passed, what can advocates do to ensure the measure is effectively implemented? It's a great question and certainly front of mind for us. Um, we're looking to develop two work groups, um, one that will be about Prop 28 implementation accountability, 
And another will be about the teacher pipeline. We imagine the teacher pipeline work group will have a many year trajectory in terms of building the teacher pipeline. Um, but I think it's also really notifying the California Department of Education that you're interested in learning about how the policy moves forward. Um, and we'll be putting out calls to action through our network. So if people wanna sign up for our newsletter, we'll be certainly letting people know when those opportunities arise for contacting the Department of Ed for any clarification, um, and if there are any opportunities for engaging in policy development. And your website is uh, createca.org? Correct, and I put it up earlier in the chat here. Okay, great. Um, I also have a follow-up question, and that is, how is it possible you had no opposition to your state proposition and it didn't require any new taxes? That's a great question. Um, well, I think the no new taxes was kind of a non-starter if we wanted to win at the ballot. So that's a very common, as we saw earlier, nobody wants to raise taxes and it's a really hard lift. So um, I think what was incredible is in the original crafting was working with the teacher unions um, and that's where we got the 80% personnel requirement was to really get the buy-in from the California Teachers Association um, and the broader teacher union community. So they were huge, huge partners in the lift to get this passed. Um, as I mentioned, they were the second largest contributors to the actual campaign, not to mention just the ground game they offer in terms of getting the word out to voters. So um, I think the strong union support in California, which is a state that has a super majority of Democrats, um, was able to knock out any kind of organized opposition. But what was shocking is we didn't even see organized opposition from groups like Jarvis taxpayers or the more um, kind of anti-restrictive categorical folks. And I think it just goes to show the real the real power that the arts have at the ballot. Um, in San Francisco, we passed a local ba ballot measure looking at Miami. I think we should not sell ourselves short in the potential we have right now in a moment when our democracy is so divided to be emphasizing the ways in which the arts and arts education bring people together. Yeah, that's terrific. Um, and Patrick, a question for you is what uh, in the large turnout that you had during a midterm election, and it was even larger than a presidential election year um you were giving numbers on who what what was different in the makeup of who voted young voters uh, BIPOC voters first-time voters um did it change in different parts of the state or was that consistently throughout the state and why did they come out in such big numbers what can you teach others in other states to make that happen well, I, I believe they're still going to be doing quite a bit of post-election analysis of to answer all those questions more precisely. But what, what I think we know so far, and we know this, I think, from the last three or four election cycles here, I've been in Arizona for over 40 years, and I've seen more change in the last three or four years than I've seen throughout. But what's happening is, is things we've been hearing were going to happen. One is the turnout of younger voters has been phenomenal. And there has been a significantly funded effort to get those younger voters out. That also means a much greater BIPOC turnout because so many of those younger voters are BIPOC. Uh, interestingly, while we're known for our elderly population here, we're one of the youngest populations in the country, an average age. So when you get that turnout, uh, it makes a difference in the outcomes and hence we become uh, more purple. But I do want to say, I talked about money at the beginning of my presentation, because if you look at the races where there were people known as election deniers, where there was a lot of money spent on those races, those are the ones that lost. But they did not lose everywhere. In some of the state legislative districts, they were elected. In fact, the new president of the state Senate was one of the leaders of the audit of the 2022 election. So uh, there is still quite a mix of the election deniers uh, and other uh, types of GOP. The, by the way, the Speaker of the House is not one of those. So we even have, if you will, divided Republican leadership in the legislature, if you look at it that way. Uh, at the end of the day, I believe money uh, poured into these races made the biggest difference. Okay, thank you. Thank you to all of you. And now I'd like to move on to our um, honored guest, um, who is Congresswoman Suzanne Bonamici, coming freshly off the election campaign, having successfully won. We're so grateful. And the Arts Action Fund is so grateful that we've been able to support your reelection efforts. Um, 
And you are one of the best arts champions on Capitol Hill, as I've told our audience. And we're so pleased that you're here. I hand it over well, to you. Well, thank you so much. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Terrific. Great. Well, thank you so much, Nina. Thank you for the, the kind introduction. And it's really an honor to be here. Thank you for this event. I'm sorry I, I missed some of it. Uh, I know my staff is monitoring, but it sounds like a great conversation. It's wonderful to be here with so many art, artists and advocates and arts leaders from across the country. Um, so I have been an advocate for the arts and arts education in large part because of the way I grew up. I had a, I've had a lifelong a love of and appreciation for the arts. My mom was a piano teacher. She belonged to a folklore society. We had a music room in our house. My mom painted um, modern hard edge art back in the 60s. And she took us to museums growing up, my brothers and me. And I learned all about manufacturing in the auto industry at the Detroit Institute of Arts, looking at the Diego Rivera murals. And so the, the arts are really powerful. Um, it opened my mind, certainly allowed me to see things in different perspectives. And I know that's why um, it's so important to advocate for the arts and arts education. So I serve on the, the Education Labor Committee, as well as the Committee on Science, Space and Technology. And I've seen over the years how the arts can boost creativity, and innovation, which is what we need to not only grow our economy, but also how do we solve the complicated problems that are facing our country? We need creative people to come up with new ideas. And as I think Tom was saying, the arts bring us together, uh, which is so important right now. And our, our, sometimes it feels like our country is so divided, Congress is divided, the arts can bring us together. So I learned about the integration of arts and design into science, technology, engineering, and math. And back in 2015, I founded and currently still co-chair the Congressional STEAM Caucus, uh, where we talk about the benefits of arts integration in, in science, technology, engineering, and math, making sure that people have the ability to think creatively. Uh, and I've also, as a longtime supporter of arts education, introduced the Arts Education for All Act. In fact, I got involved in policy as a, as a parent volunteer in my own uh, public school district here in Northwest Oregon. Uh, we we saw a, a budget uh, initiative pass in the legislature years ago, or initiative passed by the voters years ago that cut funding to schools. So I was the the parent who was saying, "Where's the where's the uh, band, the orchestra, the fine arts, the music?" Um, and so the arts education for all bill identifies all the resources that can and should be used for arts education programs, starting uh, with early childhood education, the K-12 system, juvenile justice facilities, uh, because we know, and you know as arts advocates, that all students benefit from the arts and arts education, but there are gaps and opportunity. Uh, the uh, privileged families will make sure that their students are exposed, their children are exposed to the arts, but there's a gap and we need to fill that gap. Uh, and make sure everyone has that uh, opportunity. So I'll keep fighting for the bill in the next Congress. I, I think it's unlikely that it gets through this year uh, at the very end of the year, but I'm gonna be looking for uh, partners to, to help me move this forward. I know there's a great deal of uncertainty right now about priorities for the new Congress. We're, we're still figuring out you know, who's doing what and, uh, and when. Uh, and I think there may be some concern in the arts community about whether we'd be able to maintain federal support for the arts, but there's also reasons to be optimistic uh, and hopeful about the future. I, I have served both in the minority and, and in the majority, now going back to I'll be in the minority again, but throughout it all, we have always been able to push back um, against the calls to defund uh, the, for, for example, um, the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Endowment for the Humanities. We've always been able to have bipartisan support. Um, I know that the uh, COVID has been really tough, particularly uh, on low-income communities, BIPOC communities, uh, but our recovery efforts were marked with sort of historic levels of, of federal funding for the arts. I was really glad to see my colleagues step up and recognize the importance of, of helping uh, arts organizations get through really challenging times. So recently, I had the honor of having uh, the NEA chair Jackson in the district I represent here in Northwest Oregon. And we visited with local arts organizations and museums. We spoke with artists and creators 
uh, and had a lot of uh, important conversations about advancing a sort of representative and inclusive vision for the arts. It was really inspiring. And I just reaffirmed my commitment to leveraging the resources at all level of, of levels of government to support the arts. I want to note that the, the sort of reach and scale of the creative economy is massive. We cannot let it fail working across political, uh, I'll, be, I'll be working across political differences to support the arts. And I know that when there were some complaints made during the COVID relief bills that we shouldn't have funding for the arts, uh, I noted that uh, a lot of the people complaining were probably uh, at home watching movies and listening to music and playing games that were all designed by and created by uh, the creative people who work in the creative economy. So I'm grateful that over the years, the arts have had that bipartisan support. I look forward to continuing to work with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to center the support. Uh, I'm also honored to have helped lead the effort asking President Biden to reinstate the President's Committee on Arts and Humanities. I'm grateful and thankful that the President has is fulfilling that request. And as we uh, recover, continue with COVID recover, recovery um, and, and trying to get back to some kind of normal, although it's really challenging in many ways, uh, we need to build on this historic support that we saw during uh, this this current Congress and our and the priority that the administration has put on the arts. So one of the bills, in addition to the um, arts education for all, I've introduced the Creative Act, and that's to invest in bolstering the creative economy and improving the quality and availability of arts related programming and importantly facilities. So the Creative Act builds on the fi financial support. Um, from the M NEA uh, during the pandemic by expanding access to federal grants for capital projects. It's been so important uh, when, in my conversations with people in the, in the uh, creative industry. It provides opportunities for maintaining, renovating, and retrofitting existing arts facilities. Importantly, the bill provides grants uh, for employment, staffing, and production. Uh, to put Americans back to work uh, and make sure our arts organizations can continue. So I'm proud to be leading two of the priority bills for Americans for the Arts, and I look forward to advocating with you in the next Congress as we move forward. Um, I know I'm planning on making the Creative Act and the Arts Education for All Act bipartisan pieces of legislation. So as you're speaking with members of Congress uh, on both sides of the aisle, um, we will be doing the same to, to hopefully move these through on a bipartisan basis. So I'll always be a champion for the arts and for arts education and honored to be your partner in Congress. I'll continue to advocate for the resources that artists and arts organizations need to thrive. One of the things I want to mention as well is um, the need for affordable housing, particularly uh, not just in urban areas, but in suburban and rural areas as well. Um, we know that uh, that that's important for artists. If you can't, if you don't have a place to live, it's hard to be making art. So that is something that's uh, um, intersects with the the need for arts funding is making sure that we have affordable housing. So thank you again, everyone, for having me with you. Thank you for all the work that you do. Uh, to enrich the social and cultural fabric of our communities and our nation. I look forward to seeing you when you're up on the hill uh, and uh, going forward with your advocacy. So thank you again, everybody. And uh, I, I got to, uh, you know, thank you for the creative act in the, in the chat. Thanks, everybody. I wish I could stay, but I have overlapping commitments today. But just thank you again, everyone, for all you're doing. And uh, uh, keep, keep up the great work and I'll, I'll see you on the Hill and uh, let, let's get this done. So thanks everybody. Take care. Thank you so much. You are truly an arts hero. Um, thank okay. You. I'm handing Take it care. over to Mital to close us out. It's been a pleasure, um, doing this webinar today. Mital. Yes. Thank you all so much. Uh, thank you to our experts and thank you to everyone that attended and participated in today's webinar. A reminder that this event was recorded and will be available for replay in a few business days. Be sure to visit us at artsu.americansfortheart.org for other opportunities and resources. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you.